this is a good one for families good one for people that just have a natural curiosity in terms of how new zealand is structured from a taxation standpoint which might sound boring from the outset but there are some quite interesting things around human behavior and how to incentivize people with tax and better ways to do it and then there's even a margin in the collection of tax which i never thought about it like what's the most cost effective way to get money from new zealanders anyways so chairman of family business new zealand uh, let me know what you think if it's good give us a review if it's bad don't give us a review but i think it was interesting so you would be the first of your kind mate there's someone that helps family business owners i don't really know of. do you have competitors absolutely yeah oh, yeah. yeah um you know there's a lot of different people who help family businesses at different levels and and in different areas um there aren't maybe so many exactly like me who are kind of free agents out there just working with families under trusted relationships and trying to make sure they get whatever they need for their business mm. right so i'm more you know I'll help the family to bring in the resources they need rather than be the sole provider of solutions for them hmm. you're yeah. a facilitator you're a connector yeah, quarterback if you like, or a halfback or whatever. But um, that's just part you. of it. But that's just that trusted advisor who you know. I know, I know, I know the advisor community. I know professional services firms, and you know, I understand the theory around family business intergenerational theory. Um, yeah. So I kind of know what works and what doesn't work. That's that's kind of my my main value add, I guess. Yeah. Well, um, I I don't know how many podcasts or if any you've listened to I, I like to unpack people and understand sure. them a yeah, little bit yeah so i don't understand what leads to, to a human wanting to help that specific problem did you did you ever work in a family business did you see those unique complications or how did you suddenly like you're playing with trucks and you're like you know what i'm gonna be a trusted advisor for family business owners when you yeah, it's a good question um you know, I started out as a, just a lawyer doing legal work, and I've done all, you know just about every branch of the law at some stage mm. um, in my career, and then I morphed into becoming a tax advisor mm. and working in one of the big four as a, a tax partner eventually. Um, I found that my the natural client base for me was um, privately owned businesses. I like to play in that space. I like the people who owned their own business. I like to work with them. Rather than a you know large multinational or internationally owned corporate or anything like that, you know, so they naturally were the clients that I tended to get around me, hmm. um, and so from that you form really f strong relationships, and you find that as you get as you get more advanced in your years in professional services like me, the kind of conversation you're having broadens out, and it's based on a much wider range of experience that. You know, working in a, in a large professional services firm and with a multitude of different clients, you get all sorts of different, exposed to all sorts of different uh, experiences and ideas and so on. And that all kind of starts to build who you become as an advisor, right? Uh, you have this background of, it's your bank of knowledge, I guess, and experience. And so it becomes more valuable the more you do it and the longer you do it. Yeah. Um, so my conversations with clients broadened out into not just being about tax, which I was increasingly finding, you know, too narrow. And um, I thought you were gonna say boring, but well, mate, no, I'm still, I'm, still a, I'm still a tax geek at heart. Yeah, so you read it and you're just like, oh, yeah, another yeah, day. Absolutely, and I still um, and I still do still do some tax advisory huh. work. Uh, so I wear a hat as you know, I'm a tax barrister as well as other stuff. And Jesus. so part of what I do is just tax advisory work. For clients well unexpected tangent because i know you're going down something there but yeah, yeah what's the most interesting thing you find in tax like was it maybe it was like an under the harbor scheme where the church was taking money to avoid tax of it you know what i mean like interesting stories or something that when you look at tax because i love that people fashion i'm glad you exist because i don't want to do it <laughs> what, what what was there something about tax that you just like either a story or a concept that you just find quite interesting um, oh, look, one of the most enjoyable uh, experiences I had, and I've had in tax in my career, was um, it was in the early two thousands, and it was GST, and um, it was all to do with tax that was imposed on tourism, effectively. So inbound wholesalers of tour tour packages would sell them to wholesalers overseas, and there was 
a bit of a debate over whether or not um, those packages were subject to GST. And um, what we identified was that most wholesalers were paying GST on the sale of those packages. And the legislation probably said they didn't have to. And so uh, we, we identified that, and it was a, it resulted in a potential huge refund of GST from the government to the tourism industry. And um, uh, and that while well, that didn't eventuate in the end, because the response of the government was to pass retrospective legislation to prevent it. So that in itself was a you know from a constitutional law point of view, as a you know as a lawyer that was kind of geekily fascinating as mm. well. Um, you know, the government changing the law to prevent taxpayers getting what the law had said they were entitled to before the change. Huh. Uh, so that was kind of cool. And But but we did get some refunds for some wholesalers and, and some of them were large amounts and they changed their lives. And, and, yeah. And you know, I really enjoyed that. So, like, yeah. you use the big word and I'm a simple man, retrospectively or something. What? So can they just be like, okay, we're they're entitled to a refund, just kidding, take it back. Or, or like, what if they paid it? Or what if they didn't pay it and then they have to pay it now because they've just changed the law in the future? Yeah, well, it, it's very unusual, right? The oh, government yeah. doesn't pass legislation retrospectively or, or you know, with hindsight. Though. It's, good, it's essentially backdated legislation. Right, changing the rules after the game started. Yeah. Right. Um, and they hardly ever do it. It's it's frowned upon. It's not good practice. Um, but they argued in that case it was you know that it was a significant amount of money. They argued the legislation never intended to say what it what it actually said. Um, mm. So, you know, so Parliament can do anything at the end of the day when it. As long as they've got the numbers, they can do whatever they want. Ah, uh, so so it's just the numbers again. They don't have to go through the court or something. Like, what if it's like an impeachment of I don't know a constitution? I know very little, but like if it's like a fundamental law of New Zealand and they can just pass it, can they do that? Or yeah, essentially, Parliament can. Yeah, Parliament is sovereign. Oh, wow. So um, yeah, we don't really have you know a constitution that has that level of protection in New Zealand. Um, huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. You're Sorry. like this this guru in tax law, and I'm asking the stupidest question, but I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, just just to <laughs> talk on tax, because I didn't expect it. Do you do you ever come across like because you hear of these things of like um, Apple uh, on a Facebook starting a company in Ireland and then saying it owes them money, so then they don't have to pay tax. Or like Nike, um, I think has a trademark name, um, and then they make all this money selling their shoes and the things with the tick on that's worth nothing except the brand, because because famous people mm. wear it, mm. and then they're like, oh, we owe all this money to this trademark that's another one of our companies, but we're just gonna be like, okay, we don't have to pay tax now. Do do you see things like that in New Zealand, or do you have any sort of uh, feeling towards these different companies, or or tax of it strategy I, I think one as a New Zealander I think we can be really pleased with the quality of our tax system oh, and yeah. the quality of enforcement from the Inland Review Department you know we have a compared to a lot of other countries we have a really good tax policy setting you know basically our tax legislation is sound the way we treat you know we tax internationals who are here um, the way that's enforced is is high quality um so, you know, and we've got double tax agreements with a number of countries. And, and, and so as a Kiwi, I'm, you know, I'm highly confident that the government through our Inland Review Department is getting, on the whole, the right amount of tax from um, businesses that are doing business in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, and, but, but at the edges, there'll be, you know, there's always going to be people pushing the boundaries and, and so on, and that's why we have the tax department. Um, but I think that you know, the, fundamentally, the legislation is pretty much right. Um, it's it's about enforceability and and how much resources the department has to, you know, to go out there and find it and and uh, hunt you know hunt it down and and try and reverse it. Yeah, you can and, tell you've been a lawyer before. You got the, the, you convey that in a very uh, more formal and uh, 
professional manner, <laughs> whereas I'm a bit all over the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why do you think New Zealand's taxation policy is good? You know, comparatively to the rest of the world, what do you think leads to something like that? Um, well, certainly in international tax, I think we just have a, um, and this is not a, an area of specialisation for me. I don't. Uh, it's not something I, I come across uh, on a daily basis, but um, I'm I am confident as a tax advisor that uh, our international tax regime um, is kind of best in class. We've got good people in the department who have helped uh, create the policy. It's as straightforward as it can be. It is designed to tax value that is added in New Zealand. Mm. Um, you know, on a on a residency or a source basis. So, you know, if someone derives uh, income from New Zealand, then they ought to be taxed on it, right? From if they're deriving income from doing stuff in New Zealand or selling things in New Zealand, they should be taxed on it. And I, and our our legislation is designed so that they are taxed on it. Mm. Right. W- won't quite well asked. What do you what do you think? Like you know, so let's say you got. These companies are, are these countries that don't necessarily have like good legislation, or they don't have good international partnerships. Do you think there's something inherent in our culture, or the fact that we're small and we try to do clear partnerships with overseas companies and we're non-threatening, or why? Oh, look, I I don't really know. I uh, I think we've um, you know we're a reasonably mature economy for our you know for our age really. And, you know, commercially, I think we're pretty mature. We adopt technology early. Um, you know, we're reasonably sophisticated as a as a business community. Um, and I think that kind of flows through into what our government does. We have a tax regime that's, you know, it's broad-based. So that means we, we tax a lot of things. And we have a, you know, compared to some other countries, we have a relatively low rate um, across that base of taxation. Mm. But... Overall, we you know we collect um, I don't know what the number is now, but we you know we collect a reasonably sort of in terms of the OECD a reasonably average level of taxation from our from our overall economy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is your specialty in tax? You said not international tax. Um, so it really relates to my work around with private and family businesses. So uh, a lot of the tax I do is around. Um, Private ownership and structuring. So, how how best to um, own a business or an asset? If you're, you know, if you've got a if you're a private owner and you've got say a business and some other investments, um, what's the best way to do that? What should you be um, doing from a tax point of view? What are your obligations? Um, so, there's that. Uh, I'm a GST specialist. I've I have been most of my tax career. Um, and uh, property taxation and trust taxation are two other areas I, I specialise in. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and as it happens, I've also got um, more than passing knowledge of, of uh, Fiji tax because I worked in Fiji and taxation for several years Yeah, and um, was admitted to the bar up there. And, and um, so I do a bit of Fiji tax work as well. Oh, yeah, okay. So you're yeah. in Fiji. When, when were you in Fiji? Uh, ninety three to ninety eight. What did anything interesting happen? Was the coup around then? Why? No, it was in between, in between a couple of coups. So uh, it was very stable. Huh. And in fact, the current prime minister of Fiji, who's just recently been elected, he was the prime minister in the country throughout the time I was there. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like in Fiji? Is it different? Did you? Did you? Do you have a different quality of life, a better one? Did you turn in up in shorts with a suit on top just because it's too hot? Or? No, I definitely wore a suit, and in court we wore wigs and gowns. You know, it's, wigs uh, and gowns, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but what's it like? Look, it's. I mean, people go there for, on holiday for a reason. It's beautiful. The people are beautiful. The life there is beautiful. Um, from for me, the work was fantastic. I got exposed to, um, you know, quality of work that I. I wasn't getting in New Zealand when I left. You know, I was that it was quite early on in my career, and I was I was pretty young, and then I kind of thrown into the deep end a bit in Fiji, and I got to work just because you know they've got a short pool of labour there. Um, I got to work on things that um, you know I wouldn't have had the opportunity to in New Zealand. Random. Is uh, is there much variation in the way it's structured in terms of law, or is it quite similar? Does one inspire the other? 
uh, there's a lot of similarities because it's essentially um, you know the Fiji legal system was uh, sort of came came out of the the English you know, the yeah. British legal system like ours it's a common law system of law. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything so, out the gate that you saw that theory. was unique? Was there any like because obviously you're doing quite um, challenging things, um, but was there like a, a certain thing that happened in Fiji that was quite an interesting thing from a tax standpoint or from a, a legislative standpoint where you're like, we might not have done that in the way that we did it here. In well, I think, um, I don't know if it'll appeal to the, you know, the average listener. But, <laughs> <laughs> tax, um, too many, you know, yeah, tax. but as a, you know, as a tax geek, I, I think what struck me was that in countries like Fiji, you know, developing countries that, they're at a different stage of their economic development and so they have different incentives and they do stuff that countries like New Zealand won't do and mm. that is um, they will use the tax system much more than we do to incentivize investment right quite you know quite proactively they'll they'll give tax breaks to mm. different types of manufacturers you know for uh, they'll <clears throat> even just looking at their VAT GST system, you know, they'll they'll uh, not impose tax on basic food, uh, just to make f basic food more affordable for people, you know, on low incomes living in villages. And so they'll, you know, they'll use the tax system more to get different social and you know environmental outcomes, even um, mm. more than we do. What about corporatization? We, we do it, but yeah. what's it, what's that? What about in terms of? I thought when you went that route, that they incentivize investment into Fiji, so you get tax breaks. That's what I thought, as opposed to a they social. They do, uplifting. yeah. They, so they do that as well, oh, yeah. and and more than we do, yeah. Huh. So uh, you know, the, back then and even now, um, if you're if you're going to build a new hotel or a new factory or something in Fiji, then there are different tax breaks that you can get. You know, tax holidays even on the basis that you're creating jobs, you're bringing. Um, wealth into the economy um mm. then you get you, you know so the government helps people to get a foothold um by tax relief and we don't do that so much here yeah yeah that's interesting eh? yeah random yeah. you know but like people are listening it works you know they do it because it works and yeah um sometimes it can lead to the wrong kind of investment sometimes you can get you know people who go there and establish businesses that really aren't businesses and they wouldn't survive in, in the real world anywhere else and they only survive there because they're getting tax breaks you know so it, I don't think that's necessarily a good outcome because mm. uh, it's you know they, in the long term they're not sustainable yeah well but, yeah. Um, but in the short term it's you know it's good runs on the board and it creates jobs and that's essentially what you know in a country like that it's what you want you want people to have jobs and be financially independent right just yeah. like we do it's a balance it's a bit between a hand up and a hand out. Let's yeah. say, let's say, interesting side tangent that's still related to tax. <laughs> we'll talk about family businesses and others. But let's say you're prime minister and it was a unique scenario where, or, or your minister of tax, whatever that is, I don't know what it's called. And you could just, everyone just agrees with you because you got this amazing rapport. And so whatever you say will go through. What are we changing and where? Oh. So this is quite radical, oh, yeah. um, and uh, I, my a lot of my colleagues in the tax profession will probably um, disagree. Oh. But uh, New Zealand's GST regime is, you know, it's it's admirable. It's a beautiful regime. It's simple. It's fifteen percent on just about everything. You know, ex residential housing is exempt. Some financial services are exempt. But you know, it's pretty much everyone just pays fifty fifteen percent on whether you buy. You know the the latest color TV, or you're buying a cabbage at the greengrocers. You know it's fifteen percent GST, and 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 so as a you know as a rate, it's it's a reasonably low rate across the board, and we and it's always called a you know broad based low rate GST regime. Fine, you know, and and it kind of is, but if you think about say basic food, education, um, healthcare and utilities, so electricity, water, and so on, that 15% rate is amongst the highest in the world, right? So households are paying 
um, one of the highest GST rates in the world on on just basic food items, fresh fruit and veggies. Most other VAT GST systems uh, have a, either a zero rate or a very low rate on those things. And that helps low-income households, mm. right? Um, and we don't. And the argument is it's, it's, it's better to um, have an efficient tax system that doesn't cost, you know, for every dollar of tax you collect, you, don't, you want as small an amount as possible going in administration costs and collection costs, right? So that's, and, and the GST system here is very efficient at collecting tax. Um, so that's, you know, it's a good argument that you just want this efficient tax system. And then to help out low-income families, you, you do it other ways through other parts of the government, right, with, um, uh, you know, social assistance and so on. Um, and it's a fair point. Uh, but I think, you, you know, I think, I think the government misses out on what could be quite a useful economic lever so, you know, and, and when they talk about, you know, possibly new taxes for um, incentivising, uh, you know, greener behaviour and, you know, more climate friendly behaviour or, or whatever else, um, they talk about maybe new taxes. Um, to, I think personally that the GST system provides just an, a, a very efficient mechanism for collecting tax um, rather than impose new taxes. So why not just increase the rate on some things? Um, like maybe sugar, right? Instead of having a fat tax or a sugar tax or whatever you want to call it, why not increase the rate on some sugar products? Is there a fat why tax? Not? No, there isn't. But oh. there's been, you know, there's been talk about having a sugar tax, oh, yeah. you know, and, and it gets called fat gets tax. called <laughs> fat tax. But um, you know, some so it's been Got done. It's been done, and um, and we have, you know, we've we tax uh, we tax products to change social behaviours and tobacco and alcohol are two examples of that and we've seen with tobacco if you get the tax rates high enough it really does change the consumption behaviour but it's got to be high so you know I think the GST system provides a way to for, for the policy makers and government to influence consumer behaviour mm. and also to provide relief to low income families by reducing the rate on some products and I don't buy into the argument that used to be made that in increased complexity like that just creates um, untold costs and collection, you know, collection costs and, and, and compliance costs because with the technology that's available nowadays for businesses, um, you know, a change of a GST rate is really just a different code in their financial system. Um, and uh, so it's the machinery of their system that's producing the numbers it's not that complex and as long as the government gets the legislation right and the definitions right and the about you know which and and let's face it just about every other country in the world with a VAT GST system does it so there's plenty of experience to you know mm. that indicates it's possible then um, you know I, I just think it's a it's it's a system, tax collection system that's sitting there waiting to be used more than it is used at the moment that's a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> so when are you running this? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's probably quite radical and I can't... I radical? It's, it's not going to happen, you know. You we'll, mean, we'll probably just end up with carbon taxes and, you know, sugar taxes and other taxes. and mm. um, Yeah. So we're gonna, you're going to get ostracized and alienated by other tax buddies, huh? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm a big boy now. Yeah, I'm, you're I'm, all grown yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. You said something interesting there around the cost of tax. Do you do you have any sort of semblance or understanding of like margin? Like, is there a type of tax that has the highest margin? Like, what's the most cost-effective way to accumulate tax in New Zealand? Um, the most cost-effective. Yeah, so for, let's say for the government. So yeah. in terms of you know dollar spent for dollar collected. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what do you know any of the margin or the numbers? Well, I don't really know the numbers. Anecdotally, I think you know. Like, I haven't. I would have looked at it years ago, but um, I think GST is one of them, and um, I suspect that uh, PAYE is another. So I guess it's just how yeah. easily it's collected will determine the cost of it. Yeah, and the systems yeah. that support. The beauty of you know GST PAYE is you know the collection's done by the employer and by the business. Really. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Maybe we should move off tax. So is but you did say something around private equity. Did or I? private ownership, sorry. Not oh, private yes, equity. private ownership. You didn't tell yeah, me yeah. how to invest yeah. in money. Sorry. No. Finance and me just came out. What what should those sort of businesses be mindful of in terms of structures, like different structures out there? I know trust legislation's a bit confusing for people where they might not have the same level of protection they thought because their trust was written on a napkin. Was it more yeah, look, um, you know, trusts have had a hell of a lot of scrutiny in the last few years and there's new legislation now and, you know, more obligations on trustees and, and you know, if you've my advice would be if you've got a um, you've got a trust and all it does is own your house, um, and you otherwise got a pretty straightforward life, and you know you're collecting super and whatever, and and you know then you've got to ask yourself whether you really need that trust. Um, but the more complex your life becomes financially, the more useful um, instruments like trusts are. Uh, you know they provide a lot of benefits in terms of asset protection and and uh, in terms of how you you deal with your succession planning for those assets, um, uh, but they come with an obligation to work them correctly, you know, to run them well. Mm. And uh, <laughs> the more involved, then probably the more you should consider, um, you know, having independent assistance on the trust as well, um, because if you you know if you don't administer and manage them correctly, then they're going to be treated like they don't exist. That's the, yeah. that's the risk, right? So uh, anyone with significant wealth in a trust ought to be um, following the rules and have the right governance around it. you, you got yeah. to think, like, because I've seen examples in relationship property where trusts weren't necessarily giving the protection they thought. You think it would only be a matter of time around creditors as well, you know? It's like you have a sham trust, in essence, where they're saying it's separate property, but they're treating it like it's their property, and they're not. Oh, exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, the person who set, established the trust, the set law, is essentially just treating it all as still their own their own property. They make all the decisions. They might have appointed someone as an independent, but they don't really consult them, and and uh, they mix their funds with in the same bank account as the trust, maybe, or, you know, they just pay bills out of it. Um, uh they never have a meeting with the other trustee. You know, that's, that's, chances are, you know, trust like that is just going to be of no use for them. Yeah, yeah it's me. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I, there's a period where I um, started an online learning platform called Money Skills and I was looking at different things like trust and how to explain it, but it was so boring and I hadn't, hadn't worked out how to make it engaging. It was quite interesting around the, the history of trust law and sort of how it initially provided um, a benefit to travelers that would go away and come back and then someone had been occupying their house, but they can't, like it would be ransacked and they, they'd been stealing stuff. So you, you, you assign a knight as a person that can look after the house. Yeah, that's a story about the birth of trust, isn't it? The, yeah. During the Crusades or something or whatever. Yeah. And then, yeah, some of the farmer would go off and, and go off to fight for their country and say and and ha- hand over the deed of the farm or the house to to a trusted friend and and say you look after it and if, if I come back give it back to me and if I don't come back you know give it to these people you know my mm. my wife or my brother or my son or whatever and um that was the start of a trust essentially that's what a trust is and you know at a high level yeah yeah, I'm just gonna push a button while multitasking because it only goes for thirty minutes. Yeah, so so what around the structures? You know, like limited liability or partnerships, or you know, when you sign an agreement with a creditor, strike out the personal guarantee because what's the point of having limited liability if you're gonna you know guarantee the loan? Are there things you should think about? Because I actually know nothing. That was just me rambling off yeah, things I've heard yeah. from other people. What do you think about when you so you either start a business? and you're thinking different avenues you should go of how to structure that. Is there a process or a framework to make that decision, or do you have like a simple way to explain the different options? Well, I think if you're a business owner, fundamentally you, um, you know, your focus is on your business, right? It's on your idea, whatever your entrepreneurial idea is, or, you know, fundamentally that's, that's your 100% focus. So um, what should you do in terms of the structure? Just get the right people in the room to advise you on it. It's a specialist area. Um, it'll this 
I'm going to provide a really boring answer, which is the structure you choose will, de will depend on your circumstances, will depend on the type of business it is, depend on what your 3, 5, 10, 50 year goals are. Um, so there's a whole lot of things that go into it, um, depending on the, 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 the you know, potential value involved, how you might see yourself getting out of it at some point in the future. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of factors go into it. So my, my advice is quite simple, just get advice. You know, mm. Get the right advice at the right time from, from people who, who's, who are specialists in that stuff. Just like you would, you know, you, if you're sick, you go to the doctor. If you you can't eat work, you go to a mechanic. You know, so when you need something that's not within your area um, of expertise, get advice, uh, pay for it, um, get the right advice and follow it, and um, uh, and then maybe get check in from time to time and have a health check to make sure it's still fit for purpose as your circumstances change, or yeah. every time you got a transaction of some kind that's going to influence it you know if you're thinking of selling your business or buying another one or something like that well if you ever yeah. want to run i think you'd be good at politics because because you can't really give specific advice well is there a horror story of people that weren't thoughtful about the structure that they had and the how it fell out as a result of that where there was like a shareholder dispute where they didn't have clearly defined parameters or they got in a relationship um, and then didn't think about that relationship and how that could impact the ownership of the business or oh, having to sell at the wrong time. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just read the cases and and you can see a lot of um, different stories of people who have uh, had unintended consequences. Um, some will be uh, it might be a not, might be a tax horror story. You might find you know you've opened up a business in Australia and and you've just gone ahead and done your own sort of structuring and suddenly you're finding every dollar you earn in Australia you're paying effectively 50, 50 something percent tax on it because it's getting double taxed you know, um, you know who wants that outcome mm. or uh, and it's not it's not necessary and um, and it's not really consistent with principle mm. um, and then you know there's stories of people losing uh, ownership or control of their business um, because they've uh, they haven't got the right estate planning around the, you know their trust and and partners or partners of their children um, who have come in and and might be working in the business and mm. um, contributing in some way and then there's an argument over what the value of that contribution is and are they now an owner in equity of some kind and you know so. Um, yeah, there's loads of stories of people losing control of their asset. Yeah, as well. Yeah, you you touched on it. Yeah, I didn't mm. even think about. Yeah, you bring in a ch children and they're contributing in some way, and is there a sense of entitlement, or they're the partner's children, and you've been with that partner long enough, um, where you know, and then the partner's contributing to the business, and you have a breakup, and then are they entitled to that relationship? What, what with re with family businesses, is there like threads or common issues that you see unravel? Because I imagine, let's say you've got dad or mum, they've been running the business. It's their baby. They bring someone else in. Maybe they force that person in because um, they want to keep on the legacy, but they're not that interested. And then there's nepotism, so they put them up. So there's resentment from the person that's been working there 20 years and wants to actually, you know, take over. What do you see come unstuck or challenges that are quite unique to family business owners? Yeah, so, um, you know, someone said if you don't understand people, you don't understand business, right? And and with families, you know, if you don't understand families, you don't understand family businesses. And and the, hmm. the thing about family businesses is that, you know, as well as all the issues of, of being a business and, and being concerned about all the operational aspects of a business and funding a business and staffing and resourcing it and so on, um, you've also got, there's a, within a family group, there's also a group of shareholders of that business and they'll be, you know, they'll be family members. They might also be independent trustees who are shareholders, so they have a particular role to play so you you're navigating through that as well you're dealing with those egos if you like or those personalities and you've got some family owners who might be or some family members who might be in that owner group um, they might be you know so say they're trustees of the trust that owns the company that owns the business um, and then you've got 
the wider family. So that's, you know, and if it's mum, dad and kids, then it might be eventually mum, dad, kids and the kids' spouses, and then mum, dad, kids, the kids' kids, and the kids, you know, it just goes on and on. So it starts with nice and simple when it's just mum and dad and their business and they've started, they've founded it and they've made all the decisions around the kitchen table and, and everything's in their head and they've got their favourite advisors and nice and straightforward. Then the kids come along one, you know, one wants to work in the business, one doesn't, or maybe neither of them do. Um, kids have been brought up in the same household as the as mum and dad, so they often share values. Um, not always, but you know, often, and uh, that's so that's helpful. But how do you get a partnership out of those siblings if there's you know more than one of them? Mm. And how do you get them to work together, especially if you know one's working? 70 hours a week in the business and another one is off doing some other, pursuing some other career as a, you know, a, a flautist in an orchestra or something, I don't know. But, um, you know, how do you balance it out? And and, and so, and, and with families, as we all know, there's overlaying all that is you, you've got the emotion of being family members, right? Mm. And, and all the arguments and the love and the, and, and, and everything that can go on with, with families and, um, it's uh, there's lots of different hats that people are wearing. You know, you you be wearing, you might be wearing a hat as a brother, but also as a, a as an employee, and also as a son, and then as an uncle, and um, as a trustee, and you know, so you've got lots, even a, or a director on the company. So lots of different hats that you've got to wear, and you've got to navigate through that stuff and the emotion of it all. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the horror stories are when um, the the business and the wealth becomes a seed of um, you know toxicity within the family. It becomes something that pulls the family apart, and you know you see the horrible cases in the courts where families are divided over money and wealth and um, and businesses, and and it's just ripped the family apart. That's the worst part of it all. I mm. think. Yeah, and the, the other the other end of the extreme, of course, the other other end of the spectrum is that families that get it right um, across generations, you know, they can they can survive multi generations and keep providing for this growing family of stakeholders over time, providing in terms of not just financially, but in terms of career opportunities and and opportunities to do good in the community and and pursue whatever they want to pursue and what whatever purpose in life they have. Mm. Um, so that you know that family business can grow into something um, that is supporting a growing network of family members over time. Yes, mm. <laughs> so right, like and employees and yeah, and, goes on. I um, I don't know if it was uh, the Art of War or something. It talks about you know you should never work with your friends or your family, just because there's a sense of entitlement or a, or a confusing dynamic that goes with it but then on the side of that you've also got a, a depth of trust and a depth of connection that if you can navigate it and communicate it well that um you know it'll give you a competitive advantage yeah look um so i'm i'm chair of family business in new zealand we you know we have a number of family businesses and members of ours and we're part of uh, uh, New Zealand Australian Association, Family Business Australia in New Zealand, and um, we're while we're relatively young in New Zealand and Australia, they've been going uh, you know much longer, twenty plus years. And um, what we do know from you know all the family businesses that we've dealt with over that period and the surveys we've done is that family businesses do have a higher level of trust in the marketplace, right? And hmm. they, the the brand of a family business. Um, gives a business a competitive advantage. Um, consumers like the, you know, the idea of dealing with a local business, you know, some local family, or they can relate to that, right? Um, and so that's that's something that, you know, we try to encourage our members to leverage uh, for sure. But you're absolutely right. You, don't, you can get it terribly wrong. And I, I know plenty of people who have a strict policy of never doing business with mm. family members. But when you're, um, you know, your mum and dad and, you're, um, or, and, and you've started this business and created this wealth and you've suddenly got children, 
there's an inevitability about having to involve them, right? It's either, uh, you know, unless you're going to give away all your wealth, and not many people do that. Um, people like the idea of, you know, leaving the world for their children in a slightly better condition than it was that yeah, when left common. for them, right? So um, generally, you're going to have to deal with that transfer of at least some of your wealth and your business potentially to your kids. And and so how is that going to happen? And it's much better to do it in a planned way than to wait for you know an unexpected event when you don't have any control over it and and people aren't ready because uh, that mm. could actually just tear your family apart. How do, how do you prepare right. for that? Like so, so let's say your mum and dad. This is going to be very niche, so I'm going to put family business in the title so that people when they yeah. have a look for it. So you you got this. You've been running this business a while, mum and dad. You're like, oh, my kid's getting older now. I'd love for them to be a part of it. Is there things you should be mindful of, of not being overbearing, forcing it, helping them discover it, help it, or ensuring they earn the opportunity as opposed to be given it, you know? Yeah, oh, you definitely have to deal with, um, you know, ideas like that, principles like that, that. How do you get over this sense of entitlement? How do you make sure that, um, you know, it's not just a big lotto win? Uh, that and you know you read the horror stories about people who aren't able to deal with a you know sudden win a windfall like that. Um, so you can absolutely prepare for it, and, and you know it starts at a very young age by having conversations about money and independence and you know effort and reward and um, the importance of education, the importance of treating people respectfully. Um, you know all those values that you set with for your your kids and when they're in the household, um, uh, and having conversations about about financial stuff and and often when the you know if it's mum and dad as the founders, the kids will just pick up things around the dining table when when they're having family meals. So mum and dad will be talking about the business, and so they'll they'll pick up a lot of stuff by osmosis. But they need a bit more than that, and. Um, and then at the right time, they have the, have those conversations about you know what's the career path for those kids? What do they want to do? You never want to force your children to do anything, right? You want them to pursue the life that they want to pursue, and it's no different for family business owners. Um, and so, they, I guess they kind of hope the kids might get involved, but um, they don't always want to. So you got to be you got to be ready for that. What do, what do you do in those circumstances? And how do you move from being a family that's working in the business and so a business family to being a, 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 well, a family in business rather than a business family? How do you sort of move to that sort of level where, um, you know, you might not be around, but your kids, the business is still there. It's being managed by non-family members and your kids are the owners. Um, and they're sitting around the boardroom table maybe making board level strategic decisions and decisions as shareholders but they're not necessarily working in the business how do you how do you achieve that it can be achieved but how do you do it and is it even in the interest of the family to do that the kids might not want to so then you might go down a different succession path like selling it at some point and uh, then you then you've got the whole issue of well you've got the wealth that comes from that sale and how do you had, how, as a family, how do you transfer that in a way that's not going to pull the family apart and is actually going to contribute to the family and to the communities that they live in? You, so mm. you had these members, uh, yeah. let's say, 100 or so. Um, and do they have, like, so you had these different business networks. You you know, I come across entrepreneurs and that. Yeah. And I, mm. I, I like to just, you know, be a lone wolf and talk to who I want to talk and but sport, so to speak. Um but with the family, is there a sense of camaraderie or a connection or relatability that's unique because they actually have a similar shared pain or joy, but in a different industry? Yeah, I think, well, that's the value that um, organisations like Family Business Australia and Family Business New Zealand, you know, provide. We, um, I, I got involved in setting up Family Business New Zealand because my clients were saying to me, we want to meet other family businesses. That's you know I, I said to my clients what can I do for you that would really be um, mm. you know significantly more valuable and some of them said oh, well you know we just want a, a forum to meet other family businesses we want to share stories we want to want some you know we're, we're privately we can talk about some pretty intimate stuff um, and learn from each other right 
because it can be lonely and as a business owner you don't necessarily get those opportunities and you might have you know industry bodies where you share you know your concerns over industry issues and so on but you don't necessarily have an opportunity to get together and talk about some of those more intimate um, family issues that you mm. experience with you know like how do you how do you deal with your family members working in the business what are the rules that you set um, do you let your kids fly first class or do they go down the back of the plane while you go first class or whatever you know just <laughs> what whatever the issues are um, they want to have a forum where they can discuss these privately and that's what at Family Business New Zealand we provide right? we pr provide functions that they can get together and network but also really small group forums where they can get to know each other more closely and trust each other and talk about these things intimately. Then then what happens is it's kind of beautiful in a way because they, they start to share resources and and, hmm. and even maybe get into deals together, you know, who knows, or you know, just do things together and that, or just socialise together. How do you, like in terms of incorporating these groups, because I, I think that's the majority of people's either wealth or mental health is determined by the environment i find that they're surrounded by do do you make a consorted or conscious effort to group types of people together or interests or industries or do you do you go wide and introduce everyone and they decide their own groups and then they go small how do you integrate those different environments so in our small groups we um we don't really have a strict policy of trying to put like with like other than the fact they're all family business owners um, we might have just groups of one particular generation within a family hmm. uh, within a family business you know so they're, they're at a similar stage of their family intergenerational hmm. journey Yeah, because yeah, uh, if you know you can imagine the, the transition from being a founder mum say mum founded the business and transitioning to to a couple of children uh, that's quite different from then transitioning to cousins who, you know, you've got a set of cousins who um, from the second generation to the third or the third to the fourth, and they're a bit further apart. They're living in different parts of the world. They, they weren't brought up in the same household. They, they might not even, you know, have, have ever met their grandmother who was a founder. Um, so it's a totally different dynamic. So um, you might put people together at a similar level of that journey, you know, similar stage of that journey. Um, but generally, we we just sort of have a rule that you know no people in the same industry, no people who are competitors, would be in the same group, and um, it's just family business owners uh, from a variety of different industries, that, and sometimes helps if they have already got some sort of a relationship um, with each other because they can it, it establishes that level of trust they need more quickly, um, but it's not essential. We find it happens sort of pretty quickly in a way yeah it mm. seems, it seems the, that generational thing's quite smart because you think hey, let's say I'm a, I'm a son in the business and like oh dad keeps enforcing his his views and I just want to be my own man but then he's got his ego and he's knowledgeable and I don't want to bring him down well how do you deal with that Dave and then you guys are all talking as sons and so, but yeah that's that's tricky are they all in the business or do you sometimes get the cousin from England and that's you know related and you just have families or is it always they have to be in the business? Oh, sometimes you have someone in the group who's not actually working in the business yeah for sure yep okay um, and so you might have two members of the same family business owner group um, in, a, in say one of our forum groups and one might work in the business one might not Brandon so you just bring families yeah. together in essence so uh, it brings families together it brings that's that's the one of the goals really is there's an educational goal but also we're creating glue and cohesiveness for the family uh, mm. unit that helps and then the wider the bigger networking events that we hold um, you know they act in a similar way but that's also just hearing other businesses stories um, and uh, and having a bit of fun because you got to make it fun right um, and then we have a whole lot of educational courses that we offer on some of the unique features of being a family business owner. Hmm. You know. I'm just, we're, we're at 49 minutes and I'm just going to push that because I keep looking at it and being rude. You know, when it gets, if it gets past 30, it just stops. Oh, okay. So right. I kept looking like, is it close yeah, to 30? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
education what courses do you teach or resources do you share oh we have a family business essentials course which is just like a 101 of a lot of the stuff that we've talked about the theory and and um you know dealing with uh uh you know establishing boards and establishing some of the the rules of the game for how the family will interact with each other and what you need to think about you know employment policies or when do you start talking about your kids about you know financial matters how do you introduce money the money concept to kids hmm. um so there's that's sort of uh you know the essentials course and then we've got a governance course um which is you know the unique features of putting together a board of a family business um and uh yeah and just a number of others on on different you know different things that might be on um oh, i'm trying to think now i'm struggling to think but yeah we've got several it's different courses. yeah the board run yeah. the boardroom's interesting i don't know anything about boardrooms it seems to be this this whole podcast is just me saying i don't know but i know more because i said i don't know um yeah so unique ways to structure the board for family business what are unique ways to structure a board for family business well it, it's not so much structuring the board it's um unique issues that family members encounter right and and governance of family businesses and it might so the um the issues will be around um uh, is it healthy to have the founder as the chair of the board and the ceo of the business is that right is it good governance? Um, how do you? What sort of independence do you need around the table? What sort of, um, what level of uh, executive representation? So it's non-family executive representation from the business do you need around the mm. boardroom table? Um, who appoints them? Which family members appoint them? Who gets a turn on the board? Um, what are the qualifications? You know that if. Do you just have a rite of passage to the board because you've you've got the same surname as a founder, um, or you know what is it that gets you there, and um, you know say dealing with those sorts of dynamics. Yeah, that's actually mm. fascinating. I mean, cause my my obsession, like what drives me, is to give everyone the opportunity to live a fulfilling life. Um, I did finance just so I could learn money because money's a big part of that. If you don't have money, you're pretty unhappy. And then started the marketing company so I could reach more people. And then I'm going to create a scalable offering. But family, the family unit, and there's a lot of research that supports a lot of the strong belief systems that we develop are starting to be predominantly developed by the age of three, like our, our relationships with our family mm. at that point of our lives. And I always thought the best way to change the world would be to help parents and leaders. So it's interesting that you're helping the family unit. And I think about the dynamics of the individual family members and you talked about a clear right pa passage to be able to express yourself on the board or having someone outside of the family that's not solely emotionally invested so they can communicate more effectively as a unit. Quite interesting to think of the human behavior extrapolated to the business filtered through the family. Yeah, and... Um Exactly, and and so that that emotive element's always there, right? And the, and and some dominant personalities, yeah. um, for sure. And then you've got, um, you know, the, you you you've got people who are immigrants to the family. So you know, partners, spouses come into the family, and they you know they're <laughs> they're the parents of another generation yeah. of family business owners, right? Even if they're not going to be owners themselves, their children will be. So there's that dynamic, and how do you how do you bring them in and what if they want to work in the business and maybe they, they could be better at running the business than the family members who knows but so um it's it's kind of a it's, it's a complex system yeah and it's it's uh, not a closed system it's an open system it's always changing right hmm. um that's what i love about it and i love the human element of it and the psychology of it all um and just having discussions that now, I have discussions with my clients that um, you know I wish someone had had with me um, when I was at a parent of young children. You know, um, I I think that a lot of them are just issues that every parent has to deal with. Um, you know, how do you find the right path for your kids? How do you help them find their right path in life? And how do you help equip them to be independent and to be good? you know good people and to go out there and make the right decisions and and to have happy lives it's just essentially what you want for them you know yeah 
um, and you you're trying to do that in the context of an environment where there's you know they've they've got the the privilege of wealth and the challenges that come with it as well. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. I, I, like when, I see financial advice as an excuse to be a life coach. Which is interesting. Mm. You have a similar excuse. Yes. Because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. who likes to be, you know, admitting, hey, this is a certain challenge in my life. I need help. As opposed to, hey, here's this recurring revenue model where I'll invest a uh, sum of money. You'll solve all my fo- woes around money. But actually, my underlying belief system that leads me to jumping off when the markets go down or not being um, conscious of my spending or, you know, what leads to me trying to show myself worth through my money as opposed to through myself? Yeah. And, and I think the, I mean, you kind of nailed it really. The, the, what drives the founder won't be the same as what drives the next generation. Right. Mm. It, it just won't be the founder is, you know, they've built up this amazing they might have started from nothing, just in the backyard, and say they've built up this amazing business that employs, you know, a couple hundred people or something, and they've got, um, they're creating, they've created all these jobs, they've created this wealth for themselves and their family, and um, they've got there by grit and risk taking and really hard work, and you know, hundreds of hours a week maybe, and just slogging it out and probably spending very little time with their family. And just working wholeheartedly on on their their real baby, which is the uh, well their other baby, which is the business, right? Mm. And then it's really interesting because um, when their kids are at the same age that they were when they started out on their their business path, they don't want their kids to be the same. Mm. But in a way, they want them to have the same at- personalities and characteristics because. To, to the founder, what you know, success in life comes from that sort of hard work and commitment and obsession, you know. Um, but and so when they don't see that in their kids, it worries them because they worry that their kids won't be able to create the wealth that they have. Um, but the flip side is they don't want their kids to uh, not have time with their own children because uh, they, you know, they might have reached a point where they regret to some extent yeah. that they didn't spend more time with their kids and. So that's something that happens as well, you know. Um, so there's a yeah, there's a lot going on, for sure. That's yeah. what that's why I love it so much. It's just and they're real people, and so many of them are doing, um, you know, quite apart from the family, they see their the people who work for them as part of their family as well. Uh, and you see like times that New Zealand's going through at the moment, you'll see a lot of family businesses that are really reaching out to their employees and helping them. Um, if they're, you know, in some sort of a challenging situation. And yeah, you know, are there bad eggs? Of course there are, but on the whole, I think most of them are just, um, they really care about the people who work for them. Makes sense, eh? Yeah. Because your proximity with your family members that you love, so then that incorporates a lot of them being involved, which would probably encourage other employees to involve their family. Mm. And then you've got that unit that's not too dissimilar to a family in itself. Yeah. Because it's like a tribe. A tribe, yeah. That's it. Random, didn't yeah. expect this. Yeah. Um, we're at a we're at fifty eight minutes, so conscious of your time. I've, um, what's the hardest? This is this is side tangent. What's the hardest thing about growing a business like yours? Like, is it finding them? Is it convincing them? Like, how many family business owners? Do oh, you, you mean say so our organization, Family yeah. Business New Zealand? What's the hardest thing? Yeah. Um, Oh look, yeah, the hardest business, the hardest part of it is is just getting new members to. It's he, it's them hearing about us, really. Um, you know, we're maybe New Zealand's best kept secret. I don't know, but it's it's just getting them to hear about us, and and once they do, once they get involved, we find, you know, we we've got a ninety seven percent membership retention rate, so hmm. it's pretty sticky. So so I think we're doing something right, but we've just got to get them in and. You know, there's always a it's discretionary spend. You know, it's not it's not a have to have. I guess that's how it's seen. So um, it's not going to be high on the list of priorities in terms of um, where you're going to spend your dollar at the moment. Um, it, yeah, it, it would be an interesting because my background's commissionary sales and management because I was scared of people, so I just did it as a job <laughs> to work it out. But uh, 
it'd be interesting how what sort of emotional lever or what sort of thing leads to them buying that because i it makes sense to me you got a sense of camaraderie in a unique way that has a diverse range of industries that aren't in competition to each other it's going to help facilitate and grow your business while them actually understanding and being compassionate about your journey so it makes a lot of sense to me if i sat down with a business owner being like bottom line how am i going to make you money this often now they think what's the commercial blah 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 how do you sell that like what what are what are they what leads to them buying is it the vision is it legacy do you see like in finance it's like choice security freedom usually yeah yeah what leads to them buying a membership yeah with our organization yeah um well it's usually the recommendation of someone else right um so what and why do they do it well they i think i think the fun element is important mm. right they get to spend time with other family business owners and they develop personal relationships which um which they enjoy uh that's part of it i think more than that though they've reached a stage in their own journey where they they're opening their minds to you know what they don't know what they need to know about um that intergenerational path um you know what's next for my family business they've done really well at establishing a great family business and they're now looking at well you know how do i transition and who can help me? And hmm. so um, some light comes on that, that I thought, well, we need to address this and we need to do some work on it. And here's an organization that can help us find the right people and the right sort of information from other family businesses, not just from a bunch of advisors who, you know. Hmm. don't know the intricacies of how Barry annoys me, but I still love him. The, the, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> So that does that that would suggest to me that they're a similar age demographic. Uh, what well, you would expect, there'd have to be some sort of triggering moment where they're thinking of legacy. It's interesting. It's um, we've got our membership consists of the whole whole range of ages. Okay. And um, you know, I can think back to an event we had at the end of last year. Um, I was in a small group at a networking function, and we had an had an elder kind of a bit of an elder statesman, if you like, of, of a family business. He, you know, he'd established this business years ago and it's now run pretty much by the second generation, but he's, and he's stepped back and, and he's just, he's done, he's done it, right? Been there, done that, got the credentials, great person. Um, and in the same group was a young, young fellow who had just started out, was starting out, you know, with his, his own business, uh, with his wife and, they, um, oh, wife, you know, yeah, good call. yeah, I didn't so, think of partners, yeah, yeah. So, the two of them, and um, they were uh, just starting out on their path, and um, they had a conversation. I was just kind of watching this conversation happen, and out of it came uh, basically a mentoring relationship where they exchanged cards. and The older guy said, Look, why don't you just have coffee with me once a month? You, you can have my time and I'll just talk to you about my experience in business and you take from it what you want. And, hmm. and so that it developed that ongoing mentoring uh, connection. That's the sort of thing that we're looking to, you know, create for families. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. I, I, I've never achieved anything in life without anyone else, you know, like without yeah. them being the idea, yeah. the support or something. So, but then you've also, it's like networking with a certain affinity. So it would be a warmer version of yeah. what you might normally network with. And it's I, I'm just always gobsmacked and uh, really humbled by the extent to which people are prepared to share their own experiences, um, their own failures, uh, you know, things that didn't work, and to offer their time to other people hmm. in those sorts of settings is really humbling and it's powerful, you know, when you get that in a room together. Which would yeah. lead to the retention. Part of, part of your... Yeah struggle to be the most the, the least kept secret in New Zealand that's right would we be... might need some marketing help <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe um cool man well speaking of marketing what would be the who you should reach out to you I guess family business owners and how would they find you how this would they the find pitch. oh We're how would the they close, find mate. us yeah. oh right yeah look cool um view. if look for our website so familybusinessnz.org um and our, and we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook as well. 
um, it's probably the best way to find us through the website. Cool. Yeah. Well, you've done your first ever podcast, mate. All right. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we'll finish. Thanks. Very good. <laughs> Cheers.